So this is initializer lists are broken. Let's fix them. And uh, for those of you who just got here, I was saying earlier, I am referring specifically to the initializer underscore list, the actual object type, which is slightly different than, than well, we'll get into it. So if this is what you're expecting, you have a chance to go run to one of the other popular sessions going on right now. But thanks for coming. So uh, my name is Jason Turner. Um, I first used C++ in 96. Co-host of CBPCast, which reminds me, I forgot to pull out my swag. So if anyone wants any t-shirts during the talk, I have exactly three. Medium, large, and extra large. So I'll have those available. And sorry for the video with the minor distraction here. And I am host of C++ Weekly. I'm at like 114 episodes now or something. I release a video every week on YouTube. And I'm Microsoft MVP. I'll skip over those other things. I am independent and available for training and contracting. And well, there's not enough room here for anyone else to move up, really. But my style of training classes, whatever, you need to interrupt me, ask questions. If I don't see your hand, yell something out, it's fine. It's how we keep it interesting for everyone. And uh, if you do have any interest in hiring me for training, this is approximately what my training is like. So you know what you're getting. So we have to ask the question, if initializer lists are broken, what are initializer lists? You have to love standard ease. List initialization is the initialization of an object or reference from a brace init list. Such an initializer is called an initializer list. And the copper and comma separated initializer clauses of the initializer list or designated initializer clauses of the designated initializer list are called the elements of the initializer list. So. Um, List initialization can be used uh, as the initializer for a variable, a new expression, and a return statement, ranged for loop, function argument, or as a subscript. Or as an argument to a constructor, an initializer, member initializer, or the right-hand side of assignment. So these are the examples. You have to love the standard again. There was a begin note up there, and then a begin example, end example, end note. I saw someone recently tweet like this. It was funny. But um, these are the basic examples for where initializer lists are used or can be used, such as, uh, well, line four and line three are the closest to what we'll actually be paying attention to here. Well, line eight also. So list initialization of an object or reference of type T is defined as follows. This is where it gets really fun. And I, I'm not going to read every word of this, I promise. If the brace init list contains a designated initializer, initializer list, T shall be an aggregate class. The order, identify, the order identifiers and the designators of the initializer list form a subsequence of the order identifiers. Okay. If T is an aggregate class and the initializer list has a single element of type CVU, where U is a T or a class, all right. Otherwise, if T is a character array and the initializer list is a single element, then it's a literal string. Otherwise, if T is an aggregate, aggregate initialization is performed. Otherwise, if the initializer list has no elements, it's value initialized. Otherwise, if T is a specialization of standard initializer list, this is the bit that we will be paying attention to. What does specialization mean? What's that? What does specialization mean? Uh, well, we'll... Repeat. Repeat question, sorry. Oh, yes, sorry. The question was, what does uh, specialization mean? Um, that I... I believe it's just referring to a particular type of initializer oh, list in this case. And yes, a, yes, a template instantiation. Otherwise, if T is a class type, constructors are consider considered, and then we get this, um, uh, actually, sorry, I wanted to go back up to this one. The object is constructed as described below. We'll come back to that. Otherwise, if it's a class type, constructors are considered. Otherwise, if it's an initializer list, uh, an enumeration, Otherwise, if the initialized list has a single element. Otherwise, if it's a reference type or PR. Everyone knows how initialization works with brace initialization, right? <laughs> Otherwise, if the initializer list has no elements, it's value initialized. Otherwise, the program is ill-formed. Just for the record, I stripped out all the notes and all the examples from this bit of the standard. And Kate Gregory has been kind of making examples of how we should simplify things as much as possible. 
And I wonder if it would be possible for the committee to take time to simplify this to what is the minimum required here. So what is an initializer list? Many different things. This is my bonus example. This is an initializer list, effectively because these things are in <coughs> braces. And this is base class aggregate initialization. So with these nested braces here on line 14, we are saying we want to initialize the furthest base class base, its integer i to 5. We want to initialize the intermediate class double to 4.3. And we want to initialize the outermost derived car c to the letter c. We'll come back to this too. Now, <clears throat> who all reads Reddit? Everyone in the room, pretty much. Did you see this one? This is a post from, uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago. I've read that brace initialization is supposed to be better for years. For me, the edge cases seem to outweigh the benefits. I've tried to use it in a few projects now, including full conversions. I'm pretty sure I'm going to revert back and refuse to use it in the future. Um, and then he goes on, the author goes on to say, I'm curious if others have the same feeling. Did anyone read this discussion? It's approximately 71 comments of people agreeing with this Reddit post. However, I say, is anyone going to argue with me that the bottom block is somehow better than the top block? Now's your chance. No? No takers? Not for int? Uh, we're discussing int at this exact moment. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So we will be focusing specifically on the usage of initializer lists that result in an initializer list object being constructed. All right, some code quizzes. What does this code do? Two integers of value 2. Two integers of value 2. Any argument? All right, two integers of value 2. What does this code do? Three integers of value 3. What does this code do? Two integers of value 3. Wait, 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 wait. I think I heard a couple of different answers. Did every, everyone say two integers of value 3? Yes. OK, just making sure. All right. <clears throat> this works by implicitly calling for us the initializer list constructor for vector. What does this code do? Too much. <laughs> <laughs> it copies the first one. Well, well, from a, a higher level perspective, what do we have? <coughs> we have a vector of two shared pointers. OK. This is using C17's uh, in, uh, class template type deduction. It is, yes. Kind of, kind of handy right here. Kind of. Kind of. Two shared pointers, um, yes, using C17's class template type deduction. And what does this code do? OK, compile error. Who does not know why this is a compile error? Or who does know why this is a compiler error? Be more likely to raise your hand. So there's maybe a couple of people who don't know why. We will get into why. Yeah, well, I think we'll still, uh, well, I think we might still get there, oh, Jonathan. Jonathan said, code quizzes at C++ now aren't fun for the camera. OK, how many shared pointer objects exist online on this line of code? No, it's less than six. The uh, four, it is four, four, I think. I like it. OK, so we're at C++ now. Code quizzes aren't fun. And we're still going, I don't know, four, six, 12, I don't know. <clears throat> What's that? An even, an even number. And five is right out, yes. OK, the answer is four. OK, this, by the way, 
<laughs> four factorial. Oh yes, uh, this is twelve twenty-four. No, it's not. It's it's not. That's that is four exclamation point, not four factorial. Okay. Uh, and thanks, Ben, by the way, for first bringing this to my attention. What uh, what is printed from main? We are going to assume that argc equals one. <laughs> that was official retraction of Jonathan's code quiz comment. Good. I know Ben knows the answer, so he doesn't get to answer. Well, he should know the answer. Where does where does the initialized list? Okay. Does anyone want to actually guess what this will print, or you're all just going, it's probably undefined something something? Rust. We will get to the. We will get to the details. Oh, oh right. This is my. Uh, so I, I, I should back up for a moment. This is my magic that I can do on any of our slides. If we have any questions, I can click on them and bring up this thing. Has anyone seen this program before? Yeah, Compiler Explorer. Only people who have actually been to my classes have actually seen the ability for me to click on it and go live into it. This is the first time I'm doing it in a live uh, recorded presentation. So I'm running a local instance of the Compiler Explorer. And I'm since I'm running a local instance, I can do the, I can do the run the thing. And as you correctly guessed, it's printing 0, 4,196,080, comma, 0, comma. Well, that's because I wasn't careful with my trailing comma on line 10. Is that clear for everyone? Uh, for bonus points, it is highly dependent on what compiler you use. So it's used to see 6. Um, yeah. What does Klein say with W everything? Oh, uh, yeah. all right, yeah, what will Clang say with W everything was the question. And um, I will use a trunk build from a couple of weeks ago. And uh, yeah, yeah, this is, this is a great question. It will probably tell us that even though we're compiling in C++17 mode, we're using auto, which is not compatible with C++17. So we have auto is not compatible with C++ 98. Initializer lists are not compatible with C++ 98. Initializer list object is incompatible with C++ 98. Missing prototypes, C++ 98 compatibility, and C++ 90 compatibility. No meaningful warning for what is happening here on any compiler. I will promise you that. <laughs> I will not repeat that comment. <laughs> So the answer is, in fact, unknown. OK, so I said the, the below. We will, you know, it said initialized list is constructed as below. This is the below. Object of type initializer list of E is constructed from initializer list as if the implementation generated and materialized a PR value of type array of N of const E. This is the specific example from the standard. So in the top block, we are calling this constructor for x that takes an initializer list. And we can see down in the second block, it has done as if it has materialized a local array, that is const, on line 1. And then it is calling uh, effectively pointers into that array. Now, I think to go back to this example, why did I have to put argc in here? Uh, the, the comment was because the compiler would have optimized it away. It's slightly more complicated than that. Since this would have been a const array of const values, they would have been moved into the non-volatile bit of the program. And so then referencing pointers into it would have still been valid. Would, would Ish. Have been the actual thing or just it would have been accidental that that worked. I believe we're still in the realm of undefined behavior. Yes? I'm still not getting why it doesn't work. Doesn't it get lifetime extended with 
No. It doesn't get, the question is, doesn't it get lifetime extended? It does not, and if you want to know specifically why it does or does not, that is. But it's, it's returning by value, right? So this thing is a PR value. No, 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 no. That's, uh, I will get into what that exactly looks like in just a second. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Desugared, is that what you said? Yeah. I've never heard that verb before. I'll use it in the future. Okay. Um, so, a couple of notes. First is const west versus east const. We all are participating with our, yes. It's a weird conference this year. <laughs> so, um, the standard says, an array of n of const e that reads an awful lot like uh, west con e wait east const right that reads like east const, but the specific example is const west. I just thought that was interesting. The other thing is notice here on line one, each of these values has been brace initialized to the specific type of the initializer <coughs> list. So you're not allowed to do narrowing conversions, basically. Otherwise, we would, we would get a compile time error here. But uh, an int to a double is not a narrowing conversion. OK. So our unique pointer example, which all of you got right, but to break it down, this is what it's doing. It has materialized a local array right there. And then we are trying to copy those values into the vector. And similarly, with our shared pointer example, we've materialized a local array of shared pointers, and then we are copying them in. Now, Vittorio, this is your specific uh, oh, question here. So we have a local array that we are then returning a pointer into, and no compiler will give us any uh, diagnostic about this. Probably now they will. Um, I can, I can actually come up with many cases of returning references to locals that no compiler will warn on. The warnings that they give you are things like, you're using an uninitialized variable. No, no, I'm not. I'm using a variable that was destroyed a long, long time ago. <clears throat> so, do we agree? You don't agree yet that initialized lists are broken? Well, I agree with that statement, but not for that reason. Oh. Okay, well then why, if you don't agree for that statement, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I was kidding you. Um, you don't agree for the reasons that I gave that initializer list are broken, what? Just because reference view types, like, like, just like string view, is broken if you do something similar. But, you know, well, that's why I said. As long as everyone knows that it acts like a reference, like a view to some other data, it's but, a useful thing to have. But well, so the comment was things like string view can return references to local data also. But the string view, excuse me, initializers are not the kind of initializer list that we're talking that I'm trying to talk about here. The initializer underscore list thing doesn't come into play with a string view. It is doing a direct initialization of the uh, or a, um, an aggregate initialization of the values in the string view. Which I'll actually show a little bit more examples of that in a moment. I was just saying that like view like types in general have this danger. Oh, view types, yes. Necessarily mean oh, okay. So you don't agree uh, because this is a view into a thing. Okay. Oh, this is is this the box I'm supposed to stay in? I just noticed there's tape here. <laughs> oh well. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. So the, the the comment is this is a view like thing. Okay. And view-like things have this potential to escape the lifetime of the thing that they are viewing. Right. That is true. Uh, well, let me finish my comment and then I'll... Uh, so, um, I agree. However, I would argue that almost no one who uses initializer list knows that it's a view into a thing. The other things are called like underscore view. Yes? I want to go there. It should just be called initializer list view. And this wouldn't be a problem. If it were called initializer list view, then this perhaps wouldn't be a problem, or array view, or Input. span. But, but you don't have the magic. You don't have the data what you're, what you're viewing in, so what it was kind of silly to call it view. Yeah, it's, yeah, you don't know that it's a view because it was created something that you didn't even know was created for you in the first place. That's why it's broken. Okay, so we have a pseudo consensus. 
All right, let's see if we can fix them. I, did, I, I say let's fix them because that's in the title, but I really should have said let's see what we can do. Um, all right. Uh, right, so we're going to break down some more examples. In this particular example, we've got our initializer list. Uh, I didn't show the, the, base, the, the sugared code. I'm only showing the desugared code. So we've got one vector allocation because it knows the size of this thing up front, two shared pointers being constructed, two shared pointers being copy constructed into the vector, then the vector being deallocated when the scope exits, and four destructors ultimately being called because you had the two um, the, the two shared pointers that were in the array, and then the two shared pointers that were copied into the vector. Yes? Okay. So let's compare this to the in place back versions. And by constructed here, I, I realized later, perhaps I should have qualified this a little bit better. By constructed, I mean like new shared pointers being created, not the ones that are copied or moved into. So. Two constructed, zero copied, two moved. Oh, that's very confident of you. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> resizing it. Ah, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, okay. You can't reserve. Except for, except for the caveat, oh, well. You can't reserve. <laughs> if we had, re okay. Uh, so the, the quickly gave an answer was. For a different piece of code. For, for, <laughs> was, was for a different piece of code, yes. For a better piece of code. Okay, with this piece of code, that we are currently looking at, how many shared pointers have we created? Or have we, cons you know, a return from make shared, let's effectively say that. Two. Two, okay. How many are copy constructed? One. Zero. Uh, no. zero. Zero, okay, that's fine. All right, all right. How many are move constructed? More than two. More than two. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Is shared pointers move constructed not accept? Yes, it is. Yes, yes. Uh, so the question was, is shared pointers move constructor no accept? And if you want more information on that particular topic, you can watch one of my recent C++ weekly episodes on why no accept matters. That is slightly outside the scope of this, although we might experiment with it in a few minutes if we have time and care. Okay, so how many are move constructed? Approximately said more than two. Three. Let's, okay, we, we'll, we'll walk through it. So zero allocations and zero shared pointers on the first line. Then we do a vector allocation, and then we do a con what? Oh, sorry. Then we do a construction, and then we do a move of that thing into the shared pointer. Now, and then we do a destruction. And then on the second one, we have to resize the vector, so that's a reallocation. Then we have to do the construction of the next shared pointer. Then we have to move the original shared pointer into the newly allocated memory, move the new shared pointer to the end of the newly allocated memory then destruct the two moved from things, and then we get our vector deallocation and two destructors called on scope exit. So um, I have samples because I can. It, does anyone question what we just did? Because I can walk through it or not. We have, yeah, we have, I'll just prove it. We have our vec, nothing has happened here, and then we're going to do this. Now, is anyone going to question this code that I'm currently writing? If you're not, you will in a minute. So um, let's leave that version. We've got the one constructed, the one moved into place, and then the two destructors. And then let's do a thing to let us know where our last event was. And so we can see in our compiler explorer output, we then, yes, bless you, got the next one constructed, then the two moved around when it was resized, and then four destructors called at the end. All right, so no one's going to question this quality of this code. Like it's bad. <laughs> but no, uh, are you still saying it's bad because of reserve? No, you can also avoid template. OK, thank you. All right. I was, I was just hoping someone would say that. What if we use in place correctly? The entire point of in place is that it is a call to the constructor of the thing. So if we do in place back without making that temporary, uh, sorry, I'm not running the program. No output at all would be really special. Completely remove the whole program. Then we don't get that temporary in the move. 
Now, then that would call into question why I am not doing that with make shared, because there's no way to. Why are we using make shared? Just as an aside. Exception safety, one allocation. Avoid what, sorry? Avoid raw new, yes, if you have a, a coding standard that says no news, that basically, I mean, it's the best practice. Everyone pretty much agrees. There are reasons to avoid make shared. They are slim and not for everyday use for sure. So our comparison is with our initializer list, we got one vector allocation, two constructions, two copies, four total destructions in the deallocation with our in place back. We get one allocation, two constructions, three moves, five destructions, and a vector deallocated and a vector reallocation, exactly however that happened. I don't know if it calls realloc or whatever internally, probably not. Okay. Vittorio, what happens if we use reserve? <laughs> we save a move if we use reserve. We get, well, we save Two move, three, two, uh, yeah, and a destructor, one, right, one move and a destructor, right. So we're back to, we're back to the case that we got with the initializer list, except we have now two moves instead of two copies. That is what we have gained so far. Now, we're using an array. How many copies or moves or whatnots do we have here? This, I will break it down, Arthur, if you. Uh, it's, isn't it basically the same? So, um, the uh, basically the same as what? As the, the vector case with the initializer. No. no. It's the same as the sys file. Yes, and I will show why. And this directly relates to the conversation that we were having earlier that no one watching this YouTube video later will know anything about. <clears throat> so. We have two constructors and two destructors. That's it. This is our ideal best case. Why is it so much better? Array looks pretty much something like this. This is like, this is the basic array. We can add more stuff to it if we want to, but it is a templated class that has a type and a size and a C-style array in it. You can directly access the C-style array. So remember, our aggregate initialization example from earlier, I think I promised I would come back to it. So if we have our array, then our construction of the array object is directly initializing the, the data in there. This is the truly idealized goal. This is the absolute best possible case that we could get to. It's probably not gonna happen, but it's our best bet. All right, now. First question is, why is the initializer list not movable? Does anyone know the answer to this? Oh, why? Uh, dot begin and dot end are const qualified. Dot begin and dot end are const qualified. Why are dot begin and dot end const qualified? Something to do with the array that it's referencing. Well, the array itself that it's referencing is in fact it's, oh. is const. Why is the array that it's referencing const? It could be in the data segment, but, but practically speaking, like why is it const? Like I honestly don't have a good answer to that. Unless someone who is on the standards committee who's here has a good answer for that. Although those decisions were made in probably like 2009 or something. Uh, the comment was, so you don't have to keep rebuilding it every time you pass that section of the code. You, that is only true if all the values in there are themselves constant. I mean, if they're, if they're values that could be known at compile time. Otherwise, you're still gonna have to rebuild the array every time you go through that code. Like in these shared pointer examples. I don't know which case is more common though. I mean, you're referring to the other way to one, two, three, right? So which one is more common? One, two, three, or is, uh, is this? I don't know. Yeah, Vittorio. It's magic, right? So you could simply say, if everything is a constant expression, it would be const, otherwise not. Right, so yes, it could be magic. It is, it is magic already. So I mean, I, just for the record, I don't have a good answer at all. 
So, uh, but for what you said, initializer list has only the const accessors and the definition of the array is const. So it can't be, but it could be changed. We can emulate it. We have our, uh, I mean, I, I, just, I just created this code, right? So my shared pointer, a C style array, this is going to be perfect initialization of these objects, then I'm gonna move them into the vector. This is possible. One vector allocation because the vectors uh, constructor is smart enough to see what the distance is between these two iterators first. It's effectively doing the reserve for us, and then we've got our two moves or two destructions in our deallocation. Or we could provide a variadic constructor for our vector. Blocking your view, I'm sorry. Um, so we were able to call it effectively the same way. And we are, have a variadic forwarding reference parameter pack. And then we're able to take advantage of that to do the reserve up front. And then where I'm placing back the objects. And you can't have any other constructor. And you can't have any other constructor. That would be a potential problem, yes. No problem. You cannot try to try for the We will get there. Uh, yes. For, for the video, we'll get there. Um, OK. Right. This makes sense to everyone. Yes, Vittorio. Can you do better than in place back here? Uh, the question is, can you do better than in place back here? And I'm going to run through a few possible examples. Like um, if, you were, if you were the standard library. Yes. If you had access to the internals of the vector. If you, I'm sure you could do better than in place back. Uh, oh, if you had access to the internals of the vector, could you do better than in place back? I don't think so. Uh, you, would, you don't even need the branch to check if you need to do an check in place back that didn't check the return of the password. Yeah. Yeah. An unchecked in place back. Yeah. Probably So the discussion was that the optimizer's inliner would probably take care of any extra checks that in place back might do. The, uh, the case where it's plausible outside of those questions for how this might be done better is if the thing you're in placing back is the exact type of the contained thing, then you might want to do an if const expert on that particular thing and then do a pushback instead because of things that Scott Myers talked about when he did a meeting C++ keynote about something, how uh, pushback can be more efficient than a place back when the types exactly match. And anyhow, but talking about the actual, like how many copies of objects and moves of objects that we have and whatever. Yes, Ben. In place back here, it's doing nothing better than pushback. Yes, yes, yes. So it, it could be a pushback just the same. And it will, you, we would get the same results from it from my other test. I will show you some graphs in a moment. But do we have any other questions? But you're right, I, I could have made that. Do you like that I named it better vector? Yes. So I think the, what I thought Victoria might be getting at was um, uh, can you do aggregate initialization in a new? Can you do aggregate initialization in the vectors contained storage? Yes. Uh, we have a puppy visiting us. <laughs> um, uh, not may, maybe, but no. Uh, okay, so if we could do aggregate initialization of the underlying data inside the vector, we would still have to move these parameters into there because of this constructor call. I will, I think, fully get to why that has to be. But it's a little sad. Yes. Are you OK with that for the moment? All right. So um, we have our uh, reserve called. And then we're doing an in-place back of the parameters. And for those of you who don't know, this is a <laughs> fold expression from C17 that's folding over the comma operator, technically. So with that, we've got one vector allocation, two constructions, two moves, four destructions, and one vector deallocations. It's pretty close to our second test state. Yes? It also gets us like, possibly a lot more simple instantiations, right? Um, we're getting that for, for free. 
We, uh, yes, we're, we're not getting it from a compile time perspective free. And, and size of the resulting code and possibility of um, I would be willing to bet that the resulting binary would be the same size because it would be able to see all these things and do good things with them since it is a template and it's all in line, but that's, uh, I don't know for sure. Yeah, for a sufficiently small number of parameters. And some of the d examples that I get to further on, uh, I do limit my cases to 5 and 10 specifically because it seems like by the time you're testing initializer list of like 100 elements, are you actually practically testing something that people are going to use? I don't think so, so I kind of stuck to 5 and 10. Okay. So we, then we have another question. Do we want to move the constructed objects into place, or do we want to move the constructor parameters into place? So I toyed with um, oh, there we go. Sorry, I, I toyed with this um, version where the parameter pack is now a parameter pack of tuples, and then I. Let's see. So you, I first do the reserve, which then is going to call my in place from tuple on each thing, which is going to do an index sequence uh, so that we know the order of the parameters. Yes, Vittorio, oh, did I do something simpler? I could. STD apply. Um, STD apply doesn't let me call in place. Wait, would it let me call in place back? Would that work? Yeah. So if the parameter. The parameter would have to be a variadic. You pass a generic lambda. I'd have to pass a generic lambda, which would cause what? An extra set of moves. I'd have to move the parameters into the. And no, no, right? What? No. Take ref ref, auto ref ref, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Oh, okay. So they would have stayed. At, yeah, 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 right. All right. So I could have done it a little bit simpler, but we would have gotten the same result. I think. Yes. Okay. So I could have done it with standard apply. Right. Um, all right, so then we do an in place back and we expand the, the elements of the tuple. Yeah. Yeah, that probably would have worked. Okay. And uh, this particular one, if we wanted to go down this road, we have to somehow create a tuple set for each of the things we want to construct. It gives us the advantage of the zero parameter case being able to save an extra move in. Um, or Having to, having to move it in. So if we move the parameters and all the parameters are literal types, then we can get to the, uh, to the best case, I think, of one, construct one vector allocation, two constructors, two destructors, one vector deallocation. All right. So. Our baseline comparison is this. We're using an initializer list, some vector of a desired type, and we're calling it value a couple of times. Our control comparison is a standard array that is const, and then we are copying the elements into the vector. This should be the exact thing. Yes? OK. And then our first attempt at making it better with no copies, we have a non-const array, and we're using move iterators into the vector, which should be better. And then we have done a this in place back with reserve that we discussed before. It could be pushed back. It would give the same, or very, very close to the same results. And um, Yes, so we're able to call it with our, with our initializer list, well, kind of looking syntax. This is my results. The first thing is the initializer list, and then worst performance is my const array version of it, and then worst performance is my non-const array, and then even worst performance is my in place back with reserve. So. <laughs> <laughs> One of the more popular tweets I've made, actually. 
This is, uh, so the note here, Clang 6.0 with 10 elements being passed in. Um, and with libc++. These things are highly very variable depending on which compiler and which standard library you're using. But this is the first thing that made me say, great. We have reasons though. Also, note the giant lettering, yes. Yes, uh, I'm trying, um, no, 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 uh, no, uh, I did not in this particular example. That's just reserving and placing the object by itself. Yes, reserving and placing the object itself. We'll get into what exactly that means. We, we, we will get into this. Oh, yes, we will. Okay, note that the small differences can be due to difference in measurement. Um, so just for the record, I am using hmm, problem with two-dimensional slide decks. Uh, using quickbench.com here, these are relatively small differences. This is like 325 to 350 nanoseconds per call or whatever it is, microseconds per call. All right. So they're very close together, but repeatably, repeatably my tests were worse. All right, this is the breakdown of that specific test that I executed. Does anyone see a potential for how this is different from the initializer list version? We have the initializer list down here on line 14, and on line 8 we have our move from array that's supposed to be better. This is where things start to get interesting if you have started to fall asleep at this point. Char star? Yes, char star. So to be clear, what is the return type here from our lambda? It is a char star. Const. Const char star, yes. So the array type here is an array of const char stars. The initializer list that was created for us is an initializer list of standard strings. Okay, so now I go back and I change it so that my array is now the expected type, not the type returned from my um, generator function. Which leads me to my next round of comparisons. I have added uh, also another test, that is my, my const array of the actual expected desired type, not the type returned from the generator. And I have my non-const array of the desired type. So now do we agree that these should match the performance of the initializer list or better it? No, maybe? Hopefully. Hopefully, is that what you said? Uh, ben is thinking. I'm going to wait until I see him stop thinking. <laughs> no, okay. All right. This is approximately, and again, remember, small variations, whatever. Uh, but we're starting to see a downward trend. Our const of the array type, of the expected array type, repeat of, re, uh, I was able to repeat that it was faster than the initializer list, and my non const array is. Uh, starting to actually become faster. And that is hopefully what we would expect. This is move. Does anyone have any uh, comments, though? Here, yeah, go ahead. Is the order of the first four bars the same as It is, yes. Yeah, so that's why I said the small variations are whatever. Um, but we see a trend that these things are consistently worse than the initializer list, and we see a trend that our new ones where we are constructing an array of the expected type are consistently better. We will see more dramatic results, but these are all within kind of probably a lot of it's within margin of error. Our in place back with reserve had a layer of indirection, right? Because we are passing a variadic pack to the constructor. So I wanted to say, well, what happens if I instead do this. I do this reserve and then an in place back of the, of the constructor call each time. 
which in place back matters now. Yes, because I'm returning a const car star and place back is going to call the constructor for standard string as opposed to creating a standard string then forcing it to be uh, moved in. And our now direct in place back with reserve, we're seeing a further downward trend, although you can see that some of these bars have shifted around a little bit up here. But we are seeing this downward trend. Questions? Comments, queries. Yeah, I'm, I'm so confused. Why? Why there's a difference? The generated code should be the same. Is it just the just the porting? Why is why is it different? The generated code should be the same. Is this perfect porting or what? Yeah. This is your question. I'm repeating that for the camera. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You would think it should be the same. But, but I can see one difference. It shouldn't matter if it's a PR value versus an X value. So, yeah. but well, in the in the I guess like in most of the other cases, we are building the string outside of the vector and then passing the string in. Yes. In the very last one. We are building the string where it's going to be. It's the only, the very last one is the only one where we do not have to call a copy or move constructor of a string. Correct. Is that? <laughs> I need to look at it again. Okay, it's fine. Uh, well, we can. So in this one, since we're using in place back, there is no copy or remove of a string object that's happening. And in every other one, so you would ask, OK, so this makes sense because we have a move. So that should be faster than the, than the initializer list. The const array data type is you know, pretty darn close. Why is it faster than the initializer list version? I honestly don't know. I didn't figure that bit out. Um, but the direct in place back, this makes sense because no move of a string has to happen. It's enabled to actually take advantage of in place back how it was meant to be used. So. Moving a little fast. We'll see. I think I slow down here in a little bit. I ran a total of 16 tests that consisted of strings that fit into the small string optimization and strings that did not. And I ran versions that returned the const car star versus versions that returned a standard string from my lambda. And I compared Clang trunk with lib C++ versus GCC trunk with its lib std C++. And I compared five parameters versus 10 parameters. My movable temporary array beat initializer list in every case, but it was not always the overall winner. As we saw, the in place back in some cases can be better. So. This is what we actually learned. Let's, uh, how many letters are there in hello world? 12. How many letters approximately fit into a small string optimization in the average standard library implementation? 15. Uh, oh, yes. OK, yes, including the Terminator 16, I, yes. Yes. So if it's a small string, we have these questions. Can the compiler tell that it is a small string at compile time? Has the string literal decayed to a const car star and been passed around so many times that the optimizer has lost track of where that string came from? And how long is it? Small strings are non-trivially copyable, non-trivially movable, but very fast to copy or move, which is why my you could see these things just bouncing around in the performance. If we don't have strings that fall into the small string optimization, like this, I am returning a const car star here of hello world long string, which is now longer than 15 characters, and our movable array and our direct pushback and our well, so this is the first slide that I have I did try pushback versus in place back just for the record so 
all of our cases, all of our real options here now start to beat the initializer list flat out because we're not using small strings. Yes? Did you see a change in the list? Uh, yes. It, sorry. Uh, yeah, that was like, what, 350 microseconds or something before. But now with the long strings, we're at like 1,200 microseconds. Yeah. Yes. M big difference. Now, if you want to actually copy a, a long string, you actually have to copy it, which is a memory allocation and then a memory free from the thing that was copied from and a lot more mess going on. Now, if I create my strings from a standard string return, so my creator function now looks like this, and again, I'm still with lib, uh, Cling uh, 6.0 with libc++, we are getting my array and place back with reserve. I've uh, kind of shifted things around a little bit. Um, const, this is interesting. Um, so now our const array data type is actually having to create all of these long strings. And uh, yeah, actually, let's go back to that. So that state, oh, sorry, that stayed basically where it was. What we gained was on our array and our in place backs in general. 400, 600, yeah, they stayed basically the same. Is that all right? So long strings, returning strings, things change again. going to be doing an allocation anyway, and the move is cheap compared to the, the allocation dominates and the move is cheap, is that right? Yeah, so the in place back with the reserve gets cheap here when we're returning the string because it is, okay. It still comes down to the optimizer. This in place back with reserve, in this case, I am returning a const car star, right? The in place back with reserve is the one that has the variadic parameter pack for the constructor. So the constructor is seeing a const car star that is doing this in place back with reserve on. In this case, where I'm returning a standard string, the constructor is seeing a std string that is doing an in place back with reserve on. What might be the difference between these two? Why in the world would passing a string that has to be moved be that much faster than passing a const car that has to create a new string? Huh? The timing doesn't include the allocation. No, the timing does include the allocation, but the move is faster. Remember this comment, the second bullet. By the time we have passed that const car star into the constructor, the compiler no longer sees the length of it and it's actually having to call string length on it instead of knowing the string length ahead of time. We're being messed with left and right trying to figure this stuff out. Wait, wait, wait. You're picking it as a stored reference, right? Uh-huh. Shouldn't it be a reference to another? Oh, let's talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Oh, it's within the audit. Oh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so shared pointer is always expensive to copy. We can't, like the compiler isn't going to screw with us in the same way with shared pointer as it was with std string. So with shared pointer here, and I've, I've trimmed the fat basically, we get, oh, and that reminds me, uh, well, that I, I have stuff that I need to get rid of and I haven't been throwing any of them out, so. If anyone wants any t-shirts for your excellent answer, you just have to tell me if you're medium large or extra large. Um, we have our initializer list, our const array, our array, our in place back of the reserve, and our array of our data type. So basically everything that we're trying to be better is always better now when the compiler's not outsmarting us because it can't with a shared pointer. Yay, or something. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Yay, we outsmarted the compiler, basically, or I don't, I don't even know. 
there was a comment about constructor ambiguity from, who said that? Is it you? There, get a Frisbee. Um, the most fun, yeah, is watching people open it for the first time. <laughs> so, Simon Brand, are we all familiar with him? Tartan Lama has a proposal up right now. That is effectively what we've been doing, but the first parameter is in place T. And with in place T, we get to avoid this ambiguity of the variadic uh, forwarding reference template thing that basically my earlier version um, wasn't copy constructible or move constructible because of that. It was also default constructible and and implicitly convertible from anything, I think. I might have put explicit on it. it it's, a, it's in a bad place. But within place T here, we can avoid the ambiguity. And this keeps with a vocabulary that we already have here with stood optional, any, and variant. Is everyone familiar with, yeah? Uh, no, go on. Well, I was just gonna say, are you familiar with in place T and how it is better? No, okay. With in place T, I don't have slides for this, but with in place T, with optional, any, and variant, you can avoid copying or moving the thing into place and actually constructing it in that container. Otherwise, you're probably doing a copy or move that you didn't realize you were doing. Yes? But for example, like optional in place T takes in place T, and then the argument, it will construct the single object from the argument. Yes. But here, the in place T creates multiple parameters, and so it creates multiple objects from one of those parameters, which is slightly different. So the comment was that in place T is creating, here is creating multiple objects versus optional any invariant is effectively doing the same thing as an in place back, yeah. arguably. It's constructing the thing in place where it needs to live. That's a very good point. I didn't consider that when I was looking at this, but it's at least an, an idea, I think. I personally found it to be a good idea. Yeah. If you can keep uh, in charge of this robot, if you keep the robot from the other robot, and here it will, uh, if, if you want to keep this one, it will. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, well, there are still ambiguities left, I believe. According to, to, to Simon's paper, there are still a couple of things where it breaks some currently existing constructors, yes. Does Simon propose a way to do this where the element takes more than one constructor parameter? I don't believe so, which is why I was also showing the construct from tuple thing. It could be fascinating to try to interleave these two possibilities, but yes. You could provide that one using uh, what tuples do with a piecewise construct tag. Yeah, piecewise construct tag, but how would you do that for multiple sets of parameters of things that you are creating? So when you piecewise construct a tuple, you, you forward as tuple uh, for each object that you want to create in the tuple. Okay. So it's what you did before uh, with uh, forward as tuple, just with the tag in front. Okay, so, so, so we could plausibly keep in place T for this version and then add the piecewise T for the thing that takes a set of tuples to construct. That could be a really good idea, yeah. What is the reserved forward like in the in place? Uh, it would still be the size of param because each param is a tuple that is the constructor. Yes. Okay, so I added Simon's version on here and we get basically the same results. It compares favorably. This is probably within the margin of error for our test. It's, it's better for sure. I mean, it. There's no logical reason why it should be any slower than my version, because it's just uh, it's one extra parameter that's empty. So this is another alternative, I think, that looks good. We are using a standard array, and we are using arrays, we are using an initializer space list if you will, not an initializer underscore list, to construct our array, then we are passing that in. This is an R value reference, not a forwarding reference, so we're all 
clear about what we're looking at. And then we're just moving it in. This is effectively the same thing that I was doing in my other examples. It just has a little bit nicer syntax, I feel like. I feel like that's interesting. I mean, I don't know. What do you all think? Ugly. What's that? It's ugly. It's ugly. OK. Why is that an ugly reference? Size is deduced. Uh, size is deduced, but the overall type isn't deduced, so it doesn't fall into that. It's, it's, yes, it's always, yes. Right, the whole thing, the whole thing has to be a separate parameter um, for the foreign reference to be there. Yes, yes. However, is there a subtle reason that you're passing a player value reference here and not just by value? Because I wanted to make it clear that we are intending to move the values out of it into the vector. Yes, it's a, yes, it's a, the con, it's a consumable. Thank you, Jonathan. And <laughs> yes. Well, my intention was to make it a consumable to say we know that we were we are forcing this to be moves. Well, we're not forcing it to be because if it was const, then I don't know what happens. Make move iterator on something that's const. Does it fail to compile or does it? Silently revert to a copy like everything else. It gives you a const ref ref, which will then eventually call a copy that's not true. So, so you're saying if I call make move iterator on a const thing, that I will get copies, not moves. That's okay. just like stood move. Right. Oh well, yeah, I know const ref ref. Yes, I know which is, which re silently reverts to a copy. But the, I mean, all the move iterator does is call stood move on the thing, and stood move on the const is just not. Well, but it could have, uh, make move iterator could, okay, so, st all right. This is fun. Um, <laughs> let's say hypothetically vels is const here. On line eight, vels is const. Then that means the result of the free function std begin is going to return a const iterator, correct? I would really like to hope that make move iterator does not work, does not have an overload for a const iterator. It does. It just takes a templated iterator. It could stand against so if that's the uh, here vowels can't be const because it didn't write const. No, no, I'm saying I said hypothetically. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh well then it would be the wrong thing. Right? So you wouldn't have const. I can click on any slide and compile it. <laughs> It, it is silently reverts to copy. Yes. Okay. Yay. <laughs> Another thing that I need to teach, apparently. <laughs> but if you if your T had a constructor that took const T ref ref, it would select that constructor. If but my T had a constructor that took. Oh yes. No 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 no. Sorry. Yes. I yes. I, I had to parse that. <laughs> if if you are creating a constructor that takes a const ref ref. The only possible thing to do there is equals delete after it. The only <laughs> logical thing to do. OK, do we want to beat up on this example anymore? <laughs> All right. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> oh, so you did want to beat up on it some more. <laughs> Could I get rid of the standard array and just have double braces? No. Uh, uh, I'm 99% sure other people agreed, right? You're saying that? No. OK, yeah. Class template argument deduction can't come into play. Okay, That's why. Then, add the then I'm sorry. Add, 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 just get rid of class template. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, oh, just make this. Oh, 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 sorry. No matching function for call. Since what you're getting is not an array, you cannot deduce what size of this not array is. So you cannot deduce what size parameter is. Can't deduce template parameter size. 
Yeah, it is unfortunate. I, I thought I tried all the permutations of it, but I wasn't sure. I, and I tried to come up with some other shortcut, like something that could fall into like a, um, an ADL kind of scenario where we could just have like a shortcut thing that would be created, but I couldn't come up with anything that worked there either. Because we have to create a new object. We're not just trying to call a magic function. If we are trying to call a magic function, then we had introduced potentially another layer of indirection that we are trying to avoid. So the, the goal of this is to try to get some advantage for constructing the thing in place, but Vittorio doesn't like it, so we'll move on. <laughs> um, standard array is the best use of class template type deduction from C++17, in my opinion. Can I say that? This ability right here, to not have to say what the size or, and, and type of the thing is, but just a second. Someone commented that there isn't partial class template type deduction. And that is like really unfortunate. Like if I could say that this is an array of int and then let it deduce the size, that would be really cool. Uh, is, this is a little bit off topic. Is there like a, Oh, is there a literal for std array? I don't know. I don't think so. No, no. The room says no. And what size shirt do you want? No, you already got one. All right. <clears throat> so, yeah, that's my strongly held opinion. All right, this is our conclusion. What do we do? If we prefer literal types that are trivially constructible and trivially movable, none of this matters. Um, always try to avoid reallocations with your container if you can. The resize was really the main gain that we got in many of these cases. Or excuse me, not resize, the reserve. Right. Uh, if we want to keep initializer lists around, we should probably add a new type, some sort of movable initializer list, I think, so that containers could obstinately support this thing. Do you, do you have a comment? What would be the default when you use initializ list initialization syntax? Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't have an answer. I haven't thought it all the way through. I would say at least arguably your container would choose one or the other to support and then the compiler would have to do the right thing. Whoops. Sorry. I was specifically thinking of how when you have auto L equals brace the initializer list, it deduces to us initializer list. Oh, it's way far away here. I'm getting rid of swag. Yes, Vittorio. The, problem, the whole problem with initializer list is that it has the same syntax as something else. It has the same syntax as something else, yes. It should be, it should be unambiguously an initializer list. Okay, like so. Double braces or whatever. I, I don't care. It should be unambiguously an initializer list. So, um, yeah. Uh, well, I would like to say, I think Simon Brand's proposal is worth considering, which would basically get rid of the need for initializer list altogether. And then, this in place t and the piece, piecewise, construct. piecewise construct t, which I haven't spent a lot of time with. But regardless, we should make these things part of our vocabulary. We should be aware of them so that we're using them to get uh, the correctness of creating things in place where we want them. Uh, if anyone wants to quickly jot this down, <laughs> um, that is the quick bench uh, URL. Yeah. Uh, so I guess to kind of talk about like movable initialized list. Um, I guess talk about movable initializer. I think you could kind of default to a movable initializer if like every value in your initializer list expression is like an R value, right? If every so if, 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 so if they're all like temporaries, then you could probably make it a movable initializer list. Yeah, if they're all temporaries, then just assume it's a movable initializer list. Yeah, that might work. Um, but yeah, so this quick bench, I mean, you can take a picture of it or whatever. This is all of my experiments, so you can play with them yourself. Change the return types, change the generator functions, et cetera. Yes, Ben? So I was just remembering when I first ran into this, it made different the addition of pilots, and I think it was basically a missed optimization or something. Like it's missed optimizations, not yes. Put the initializer list in constant memory. Oh, uh, so I. Like the reason, the initial thing you showed. Yes, a missed optim. Well, and the, yes. So you said a missed optimization, and the very uh, you're talking about the lifetime issue, the one that you made me aware of. By accident, because some compilers missed the optimization. Yes. So that's why I had to add the argc to it to make it so that it failed on every compiler, 
Um, and if you don't put the argc there, then it succeeds on Clang and GCC, and it's a missed optimization in Visual Studio. And I originally thought it was a Visual C++ bug. And not a bug, yes. I agree. Um, so if you're using QuickBench, the results, like I showed, the variation can be a little flaky. Don't use it as hard numbers. Run it locally if you need to, whatever. But I mean, it's running for free, for, from our perspective, for free. But you can go and support the project with Patreon, and it's a good project, too. All right. Uh, oh, look at that. I have in place T, part of your vocabulary, twice. I consider it to be important, apparently. That's what I get for editing slides over lunch. OK. We have additional thoughts. Can we expose the internals of our container? This has been mentioned. Someone brought up the idea. This is approximately the best that I was able to come up with so far. We have a unique pointer of some data type, an array to it. So the, when a unique pointer is destructed, it is going to know how to do the correct thing to delete the array, but we have managed to erase the size info. So it's, it's kind of like a dynamically sized thing that I don't know. Um, but this is, this is about as close as I could get with this concept. So if you could hypothetically expose something that was able to generate your data structure that the vector contains or whatever, and then replace the underlying data structure with it, we could hypothetically get to the ideal case of no copies, no moves, no resizes. But I was unable to come up with something that really looked good. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts that we could code live in the next 18 minutes. Oh, OK. Uh, to confirm, is it a unique pointer to the array that's the internal representation, or is it just the array that we're pointing to that's owned by the new point that is our internal representation? Uh, so is it the array that is our internal representation, or wait, let's go back to that. All right, let me repeat that. So you said we're exposing the internals of this hypothetical container. Yes. Is the internal? a unique pointer of data type array? Yes. Or is it a, data, a pointer to data type that's a own, owning pointer? Yes, OK. So in, in my hypothetical, like, really cheap test right here, the container is a unique pointer of array type. Oh. And, and I've managed to kind of directly give it a thing. Because I have to actually call new here. I can't use make unique in this situation, because you can't initialize the array and give it a size with make unique. And uh, even if you could, we're going to get that layer of indirection again that we don't want. It has to be something kind of like this. It's to get the absolute perfect case. Yeah? We had an earlier example where you're using make unique that would not compile with that you want. No, the make unique example that wouldn't compile earlier is because with the initializer underscore list that was being constructed, that was forcing a copy, and unique pointer cannot be copied. Perfect forwarding that isn't. Let's break this down. This is my first surprise lesson learned. We have already touched on it. Um, so I have two examples. I have down here on line 16, I am forwarding my block of strings using this get character string. And line 17, I'm doing it with uh, returning a string from the function. Now. We can already probably hypothesize which of these would be more efficient, but the get car star, the get car string here, we scroll down into main, we can see that it is actually allocating two basic strings, having to copy the data into them, and then calling delete, even though they are small strings. It has generated the code for all of this. If instead we are actually returning a string from our function, instead of a const car star, we get, uh, oops, sorry, that's, we have to go to Clang. Clang is, Clang is important to this example. There. So now we are returning a string instead of returning a character literal, and now main goes away. If we go back to uh, get char string. Yes and replace the return type of the get char string with decl type auto. 
Oof. Uh, I wouldn't expect it to matter. It shouldn't matter because it will propagate type information. Uh, it, it seemed to have gotten worse. Oh, here. Okay. <laughs> that was, well, I mean, for just the, the like, you know, hand wavy, we've got 132 lines of things created. Yeah. If I understand correctly, the reason why Clang is able to be so aggressive when it's the same type is because you're doing aggregate initialization. And aggregate initialization says that if it's the exact same type, then it's going to be in place. Uh, so your comment was Clang is able to be more aggressive because uh, we're doing aggregate initialization. And if the initialization is the exact same type, then it's able to do it in place. Um, that's not entirely true. Okay. And I, can, I will demonstrate why that is not true in a moment. If you, it depends on when you do it. If you construct a std string with the car star here, you do. If you connect it with something returned from a function, you do not. Wait, you still get the small string optimization, but it calls strulet. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. You, uh, the compiler has to generate the code around it as if it were not a small string because it doesn't know. Is that better? I think so, yeah. Okay. So it generates it, but the allocation generates Yeah. Right. So. I have maintained this practice for a while. Always delay our dynamic allocations and type erasure as, lot, as late as possible. String literals and C's legacy now start to mess with our mental model. And I have, I, for the first time, have an answer of what's the main thing I'd remove from C backward compatibility. As seen in the last example, a compiler may or may not be able to trace the length of the string. Um, so let's break this down a little bit. Just real quick, what is the type of x? It's a const char star. All right, what is the type of y? A statically sized array of const characters. OK, what is the return type from our function? A pointer to const char star, or a pointer to const char. Yes. No. It's perfectly valid. It's not dangling. Yeah, dangling. It's dangling. Yeah. You're setting it as an array, local array. It, this might be like the optimizer case where um, it accidentally doesn't dangle because that might be stored in the you know, program. In this character, this character, this string literal is absolutely required to be stored. But the array is not. Yes, but I'm returning a pointer to this character literal. This no. is valid. It's the same thing. I am. It can matter because you can have two different const char y arrays for the same literal, but they have to literal, they have to have different literals. I'm almost a hundred percent positive, and we don't have time to like actually test it at the moment. That this is well-defined behavior because I recently read something that said it was. Is that a good enough answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's just say, but well, I, the point that I wanted to drive at is that we are returning a pointer still. Like, we can't force it to return an array. Returning an array is, a C-style array is, for all intents and purposes, impossible. So, um, I then played with this, which fits nicely on one slide. This is better, full size. Um, I have four different options. I'm returning a character string, I'm returning a std string, I'm returning a std string view, or I am returning this thing that I just created, which is a string literal that has the size information baked into it. And you'll notice that it has an explicit operator to create a basic string of the appropriate underlying car type. And we will go back to Clang to be fair for our comparisons. You also change line change with your leg. Uh, I didn't think I did. Line change line 23. Oh, oh, because I am explicitly, uh, did I?
Yeah, I did change line 23, you're right. OK, so I changed line 23 by explicitly creating a string here, which I had to do because I didn't want to make my operator string implicit. And that was just my. How does that change anything in terms of initialization groups? All right, let's make this not explicit and put this back to here. I, and uh, I haven't tested this at all. So let's do it live. All right. <clears throat> We have a const car star version. And we already know that the const car star version isn't able to see this optimization. It is, where in the world is main? Matt, where's main? There it is. OK. All right. Now, if we do the string version, which we expect main to effectively go away, which it did, it was able to know those optimizations at compile time. If we do a string view, string view is not, that, that breaks it here. Okay. All right, but we'll still get the, approximately the same. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll be able to make my point regardless. So with a string view, the compiler is still not able, so the string view object knows the size of the thing. It's still not able to see the optimization. We still get all this code generated in our main. But if we use our strongly sized string literal that I just made up for the sake of this talk, then it can see the size of it and the optimization can go away. Yes? Question. Um, if you, for the get string view, if you use the um, standard literal SV to construct it, um, does, will that carry, will that be able to trigger the optimization? If I use the standard literal SV, will that be able to trigger the optimization? As I, as I what do I have to do? Using name space what? Literal. What is it? Literals. Just literals. Yeah. Like that? Yeah. And then underscore SV? Just SV. Just SV. Just SV. Yeah. Standard ones don't have that. Okay. And then go back to the string view version. That's what you wanted to see. Yeah. Um, because no, it can't. Does that literal somehow fix the issue in string view that it doesn't have an overload for a string literal like that string literal class does? Yeah, it, it, you get the size. Yeah, I mean, I, the size is baked into the type information now. And string view does not have a constructor and like your string literal constructor does. Uh, no, string view does not have a constructor like my string literal does. But it does have to be able to know that at compile time because it has to work with const expert. No. Yes. <laughs> then string view has to work with const expert, correct? It forces you to use the constructor overload where you pass the size of the second argument. No, that is a bug in your compiler. Yeah. Oh. You still like this to <laughs> yes. It does work on the most up to date standard libraries like that. And the the the, bre the breakage was they are all effectively trying, well, some of them were effectively trying to call string line underneath, which isn't const expert, and then it couldn't, and then now it can. OK. So that's handy. Uh, oh, I got way far back in my scrolling back of the things. Uh, ooh, it, where am I? OK, that's where we just were. So conclusion part two. Now what do we do? We need strongly typed string literals in C++. This is my conclusion from working <laughs> on this project. <laughs> I really like the idea of strongly typed string literals. Um, we should probably just deprecate initializer lists, really. It's almost impossible to use it correctly. Yes? Can I clarify, like, string, when you say strongly typed string literals, you mean strongly typed that carry the size? Uh-huh. Yeah, right. yeah, I do, I do. I mean, str I mean, it can carry the size. There's no reason why you can't just uh, let it convert to a const car star or something when you need to also. But why, why are we throwing away that information? We're just throwing away something that could be hugely helpful to the compiler. Um, we can solve our performance issues to some extent, but cannot solve the lifetime issues due to guaranteed copy elision in C++17. Um, all right, uh, I don't have time to get into this. What happens if you, so the initializer list example where I'm returning an initializer list that I got from Ben and it was breaking at runtime with undefined behavior. If initializer list, has its copy constructor deleted and its move constructor deleted, just FYI, you can still return it from a function in C17 because it's guaranteed to call neither of them. So, 
Yes, just like mutex, right. So it's useful in some cases, and it can break our notions in other cases. All right, my final conclusions. <laughs> All right, I'm back to the same example. I have, I have made, is this, you can, you can stop me if this doesn't satisfy your needs for context, where we can run late if we need to, but we have a couple of things going here. I'm going to go back to my clean compiler. And the one, so I've made my get car string re, uh, the const expr function. I've returned uh, string view as a const expr function, and my string literal as a const expr. The one that returns a standard string can't be const expr because standard string isn't const expr. Now, in none of these examples am I assigning any of this to a const expr. Now, if I was going to here and down here, it would be required to compile it at compile time, or execute at compile time. But we can at least quickly demonstrate that it doesn't actually change anything at all. Not for our string view, not for our car string. The compiler doesn't take that extra information and do anything useful with it when we have const expr enabled. And I did not check the latest GCC to see what it does here. GCC, um, GCC. If anything is marked const expr, GCC is very aggressive at uh, trying to execute it at compile time. So that does not shock me. So uh, for extra finicky, um, and someone who knows more about these things will have to explain to me what's going on here. Um, to go back to our Clang version, this is the version that's returning a, const, a character string. In this particular case, it optimized it away. What did I do differently? I put it in an anonymous namespace. All of a sudden, it decides, oh, well, I can optimize that now. Who knows why this is happening? Because I don't. I just discovered it like this morning or something. It can't be visible outside the scope. So what? It's going to try harder to inline it, basically. Outside this translation unit. Yeah. So it's trying harder to inline it or something. Uh, well, I know that Clang in particular says if it can prove that this function is only called once, then it tries harder to inline it. It adjusts the inlining scale. What? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's why we're at this conference, right? Yeah, there we go. Call it twice and it goes away. <laughs> Which, by the way, is what was happening in your demo when it wasn't uh, uh, lighting the, the, the heap allocations. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I realized that after the talk. OK. Whew. We are going to wrap up exactly on time here. So conclusion part three. <laughs> Const expert. It is not a magic bullet. Stronger typing is better than weaker typing. Um, I think, since we've been talking about span a little bit, I've seen it come up. It's in C20. Maybe there should be a version of span that has the size baked into it. And then that would, like, why, why are we throwing away information that we could keep? And like, Vittorio's, um, uh, uh, what did you call your project for the futures? Uh, futures without type erasure. Futures without type erasure. Like, why are we throwing away information before we have to? Yes. If we, it's a second parameter for the size. There's a, I, I, I don't. It's not a different type. It just has a second template. Oh, okay. I didn't know if there was a span. There is a span, apparently, that takes a size parameter. Then perhaps that should be your default when you go to use span. Or it should be something, like, if you can. I don't know if, I don't know if it makes sense. I honestly have no idea if it makes sense. But it's, it, it's interesting. So anyhow, that's who I am. Um, and those are my URLs. And that's how you can get in contact with me. And we have 18 seconds left if there are any final questions or anyone wants a t-shirt. Uh oh, oh, you want a t-shirt or you just? No, no, I want a question. OK, did you want a t-shirt or a question? What size do you want? Oh, M. Oh, uh, M. I'll take an XL if you got it. <laughs>
All right, yes, Victoria, go ahead and ask your question while we're throwing out t-shirts. <laughs> so in, in, in the first benchmarks you've shown, I was very surprised with the difference between employees back with the default expression and employees back done manually. Was that purely because of the const char thing? It, yes, it was purely because of the const char thing, because it couldn't, it couldn't do the... I tried the same with Clang. Yes. And at the beginning, Clang generated a ton more assembly for the for the thing with the shoe. Right. I had to put always in line to make it work better. Yes, if you have to put always in line to make it work better, that's the wrong solution, I feel like. But then, I mean, that's the whole point of any little structure that's value added. We they, want to avoid initializing this. We want to be able to move from it with right. the same syntax. And unfortunately, Clang requires the always in line. Yeah, but, okay, so your comment that Clang requires the always in line to get the optimization, I feel like particularly like small string or string optimizations and like what was going on there, I don't feel like that's the case we should be optimizing for. That's not about strings. It's okay. just about the indirection of calling the variety constructor. The indirection of calling. It wasn't, it wasn't in line with anything. Right. Which is really weird. Yes. And you know, if you want to implement what Simon Brand is doing, then you need to use always in line to make sure it's the same. Which is okay, so Vittorio's argument for the video is that we need to use always inline if we want to implement Simon's uh, version. And I would really, really like to think that that's not actually the I case. Know, I, I tried it with Frank, I can show you later. Yeah, no, I believe you that those are the numbers you saw. But hopefully the, the compiler can get better and we don't have to yeah, try to do that. Okay, uh, any other questions? All right, thank you, everyone. Yeah.